and starts now. Right now at 11, after not winning a statewide race in a dozen years, the numbers suggest Virginia Republicans may be poised to sweep the top of the ticket. But still too close to call. But at this hour, it appears that Richmond voters don't want the city in the gambling business. The casino referendum appears to be in trouble. And a historic night, regardless of what the final vote indicates, for the first time ever, a woman and a woman of color will be Virginia's lieutenant governor. Good evening and thanks so much for tuning in to our Decision Virginia coverage tonight. I'm Akia Turner. And I'm Kurt Autry. It has been a night of back and forth and we've been watching every moment of it. And that's why we have live team coverage for you tonight from the gubernatorial watch parties. Karina Bolster at the Youngkin camp in Chantilly, while Henry Graff reports from the McAuliffe campaign in Tyson's Corner. And we're also on your side here at home following the historic lieutenant governor's race plus the push for attorney general. We'll get to all of that and much more in just a few minutes. But first, we want to turn our attention back to the race for governor. Right now, it appears that Glenn Youngkin is in a commanding lead position with 51% of the vote, 48% for Terry McAuliffe, Princess Blanding, coming in at just shy of 1% of the vote. Karina Bolster is at the Youngkin camp tonight where that crowd has to be energized by these early numbers. Karina. Oh, Kurt, they certainly are uh, full of energy, that's for sure. We've had the music pumping uh, for a good hour now, and so this crowd is really just looking forward to Glenn Youngkin taking the stage at some point tonight. We did notice as numbers were rolling in, that's when the crowd would really cheer, but this result is something Republicans were very confident would happen. Former Governor Gil Jim Gilmore traveling with Youngkin yesterday among his four rallies, drumming up support for the businessman turned political newcomer. Gilmore telling me tonight it's time to bring sanity back to Virginia, and Youngkin is the man to do that along with the other Republican candidates on the ballot. Meanwhile, Youngkin telling a crowd yesterday now is a defining moment to redirect the future of the Commonwealth, and that is something the state GOP chair believes <coughs> excuse me, happened today as thousands turned out to vote. <laughs> as any party does, in order to remain relevant, retools itself from time to time. And it brings new and fresh blood with vision on board. And the people will respond to that. And I think that's what's happened in this case. Is going, it went on to say he's met many people coming uh, across all of Virginia, and some have even uh, decided to vote Republican when in years past they were voting for those Democratic candidates. Again, the hope here tonight really to turn the state of Virginia red, and that is what we're really seeing out here in the crowd behind me. A lot of folks supporting all of those candidates as these numbers continue to roll in. We are told Youngkin is watching those numbers come in in a separate room and hopes to come out a little while later once a bit more of, of concrete numbers are released. Live and on your side in Chantilly, Karina Bolster, NBC 12 News. And we expect those concrete numbers very shortly. We'll come back to you uh, when Glenn Youngkin takes the podium. And just a few minutes up the road, a different atmosphere altogether at the Terry McAuliffe campaign. That's right. That's where we find political reporter Henry Graff tonight. And Henry, we saw that uh, McAuliffe tweeted out about 20 minutes ago, reminding folks to relax. All of the votes have not been counted just yet and that every Virginian, in his word, uh, has to have their voice heard on this. So how are things over there? What's the mood like now that the margin is still just closing in? Still a pretty tight race. But yet somber is the mood here right now, and a lot of folks have pretty much cleared out of the ballroom here at this point in time. Terry McAuliffe coming out on stage at about 10.15 tonight, telling the crowd there every vote must be counted before this election is called, saying he is not conceding at this point in time. Certainly not the night Democrats were looking for here. Supporters upset, stunned about how this vote appears to be going right now. Democrats trying to figure out also what went wrong. I did talk with one Democrat strategist suggesting that the national issues like the infrastructure bill and the president's sinking poll numbers 
really drowned out Virginia issues. So why no concession? Well, they believe here they have votes in Northern Virginia and other areas like Richmond to be counted that will hopefully tighten this race. McAuliffe vowing the fight is not over. Take a listen. We got a lot of votes to count. We got about 18 percent of the vote out, so we're going to continue to count the votes because every single Virginian deserves to have their vote counted. Now, strategists here are telling me McAuliffe needs 65 percent of that remaining outstanding votes to be in his favor to get this race back to close. McAuliffe also running on a platform trying to tie his competitor to former President Donald Trump, hoping Trump's 10-point defeat in the state last year in the election would roll over into this election. That obviously not appearing to be the case right now. Democrats uh, really upset right now trying to figure out what went wrong here uh, as this appears to not be going in their favor. And again, no word right now from the McAuliffe campaign on next steps for tomorrow. But of course, we will keep you posted. For now, we are live and on your side here in Tyson's Corner. I'm Henry Graff, NBC 12 News. All right, thank you, Henry. A pretty stark contrast to the headquarters uh, over where Youngkin is tonight. Well, we are joined now with NBC 12's Director of Investigations, Rachel Napampa, who's been tracking some of these numbers. Rachel, Loudoun County, some of the uh, larger counties, especially in Northern Virginia, can you tell us about uh, those results and how they're shaping up? Well, the reason that McAuliffe is not conceding and that he's still saying there are more votes to count because there are more votes to count in Democratic controlled areas or Democrat that areas that typically vote for Democrats. So you've got a lot of outstanding votes and there's the potential for those to come in. The issue here for McAuliffe is, you know, Kurt McKee, all night long we've seen these trends where in these staunch red areas and these blue areas, Glenn Youngkin has been outperforming McAuliffe in those areas by larger margins. So basically McAuliffe is doing good in his blue areas, but he needs to be doing great. And we're not seeing that right now. Well, let's talk about that because the path to a McCulloch, uh, McAuliffe victory has really narrowed at this late date, uh, Rachel. There are places in Northern Virginia that he should have just swamped Youngkin and he didn't. Even if he wins, he's not winning by enough for him to carry the rest of the state. It really doesn't look like that. It looks like we are seeing a red wave, which we saw a blue wave two years ago and then two years before that. It looks like we are seeing a sweep of the top offices in the state and then we'll get later on to the House of Delegates because there's the balance of power hanging there as well as we have a few uncalled races right now. So this looks like Republicans and the message and what they were trying to do really resonated with the swing voters in Virginia, the people that go back and forth between each party. And they did it hugely last election with President Trump going for Biden. Now you have Biden's poll numbers and you're seeing what's going on there and you have the swing voters going the other way. All right. Thanks so much, Rachel. We'll check back in with you in just a bit. Well, another race that we're keeping our eyes on is the one for Lieutenant Governor of Virginia. Right now, early indicators put Republican Winston Sears in the lead. For that part of our coverage tonight, we want to turn things over to Brent Solomon, who's at the state capitol. Good evening, Brent. How are results shaping up? Good evening to you. Hey there, Makia, Kurt, Rachel. I can tell you this, that both races are watching this race closely, especially since the winner will be the first woman to hold the office of Lieutenant Governor and the first woman of color to be elected into statewide office. Go ahead, take a look at your screen right now. We're watching the numbers with the total number of precincts reporting right now, 2,600, still more to come. But at this time, Republican Winsome Sears is holding. But as it stands right now, pretty empty ballroom. Brett and Martha, back to you. 58,000 votes apart uh, in Virginia right now. All right, we've got Republican Winsome Sears holding 51% of the vote. That's compared to Hala Ayala's 48%. Now, Sears is from Jamaica. She became the first female Republican and the first female veteran to serve in the House of Delegates. One of her passions, she says, is protecting the right to vote. And what that means is that no job can require you to work for a or to be a part of a union. I should also talk about her competitor now, Hala Ayala. She's a Democrat who serves in the House of Delegates. She says she felt an even bigger need to hold office, to stay in public service once the pandemic hit. Her focus is on health care and she touts Medicaid expansion as a promised heft. She campaigned on addressing racial disparities in health care and even on addressing gun violence. Now, whichever woman is elected 
to this position of lieutenant governor would actually preside over the Senate and she could have the deciding vote whenever there's a tie. On top of that, if for some reason anything happens to the governor and the governor can't fulfill his responsibilities, then the lieutenant governor, of course, will step in. We'll continue to watch this one for you just as we're watching every single race for you tonight. Live at the state capitol on your side, Brent Solomon, NBC 12. Okay, Brent, thank you. And switching gears now, let's talk about the race for attorney general, where Democrat incumbent Mark Herring and Republican delegate Jason Miares are battling it out for the top spot to be Virginia's top prosecutor. Riley Wyant joining us live in the studio now to break down these numbers. And it would appear that the Republican candidate seems to be riding this red wave. Yes, absolutely, but it is closing in a bit tightly as we're seeing with the lieutenant governor race as well. Just about 2%, a two point margin that they have now. But it, we are going to see that Herring has had that job for eight years and he's trying to get that third term. And it's getting a little bit nerve wracking for the Democrats because Miaris is in the lead and on that path to achieve that goal of robbing Herring of a third term. And I will say Herring has closed in on him in the last hour or so, but Miaris was sitting pretty at an eight to 10 point spread for a while there. But now you're seeing this close in at 51% for Miaris and 49% for Herring. But overall, if Miaris can hold on, it looks like this race for attorney general could follow suit with the rest of that red wave that we've been talking about that is sweeping through Virginia. And keep in mind, the AG defends the constitutionality of state laws and among other, other things, and that's what challenger and Republican Jason Miares has tried to base his campaign on, is just restoring that law and order. There are huge implications if he does win this because he would be Virginia's first Latino attorney general. He hails from Virginia, but he is the son of an immigrant. He says his mother fled from communist Cuba when she was just 19 years old, and Miares wants to abolish parole for certain violent criminals. He also wants to curb the state's increasing murder rate and reform the state's parole board. The Democratic Party has criticized him, saying that Miares is against Medicaid expansion and opposes stricter gun control measures and criminal justice reform bills. Herring has held the job for quite some time, and he said he's worried that Miares could undo a lot of the social progress that has happened and believes that the next four years are consequential as voting rights, LGBTQ issues, and abortion could all end up in courtroom litigation. We'll be keeping you in loop on our digital platforms as all of this, as all of this comes down tonight. So on your side, Riley Wyant, NBC 12 News. All right, thank you, Riley. Well, all eyes are certainly on Richmond's casino referendum. Did Richmonders vote yes or no for one casino and resort? A look at the results tonight reveals that the answer is no at this moment. You have 51% for no, 49% for yes, and you can see the numbers uh, of voters who cast their vote. On your side tonight, Desiree Montilla, keeping an eye on all of this for us. And Desiree, how is the race now? We just saw some numbers, but uh, what do you know? Well, Makia, those unofficial results started coming in just two hours after the polls closed, and that that margin has been narrowing since the results came out. Right now, Richmonders, a majority of Richmonders have voted no, but that's leading by 51%, and that's close to 2,000 votes, separating the no vote from the yes vote. But keep in mind, there's still some provisional and absentee ballots that need to be counted. Now, to remind you all at home about the proposal on the table, Table. Developers want to bring one casino and resort to the city's south side. Now, this includes 100,000 square feet of casino space, a luxury hotel, a live theater, and dozens of new restaurants. There's been split views on the ballot item. Many want this to come to support these new jobs, but others believe this will become a center point for gambling addiction. We talked to voters on both sides of the debate earlier this afternoon about their views, and here's what they had to say to us. I think it's a good idea for them to bring that in Richmond. Gambling is a very fraught endeavor, and so I, I worry about that. Again, Richmond is the last of five Virginia cities to vote on a casino. And for the Virginia cities who had this on their ballot last November, all overwhelmingly approved. So we're going to keep track of these results. And again, we're still waiting on how many provisional and absentee ballots 
come in and whether or not that will sway the vote. And we will bring you those results as soon as they come in on our digital platforms. Live and on your side in Richmond this evening, Desiree Montilla, NBC 12 News. Alrighty, thank you, Desiree. And checking in now on the on the Richmond Sheriff's race. It looks like Antoinette Irving has secured victory there with an overwhelming majority. Take a look at that. Michael Dick Dickinson and Antoinette Irving. You can see those numbers on the screen here. She has 77% of the vote and Dickinson has 23%. Now, while the Department of Election says that it was a smooth election day at the polls, there were still a few bumps along the way out there. Check out this line of voters standing at the Lifelong Learning Institute precinct in Chesterfield County. That was around 7 o'clock tonight. According to election officials, two precincts in the county did run out of ballots, but voting continued. Voters who were in line say that they heard the location was out of ballots, but they were told to come back later. The line wasn't moving, so we started talking to the various people. We found that out. There weren't any ballots. And uh, so we were told they're trying to get more ballots. Uh, so then what we did is that we, we left and we came back. Well, Chesterfield election officials at the precinct say that the extra ballots given to them were for another precinct, causing even more of a delay. Everyone who was in line by 7 p.m. was still able to vote. We asked the Department of Elections about the shortage in ballots, and we were told that it was due to a heavy turnout today. Those that did not opt to leave the line were able to vote through an express vote machine. Other counties who ran out of ballots include Albemarle, Madison, and Palatine. Less than 24 hours before Election Day, Virginia delegate Chris Hurst was pulled over by Rad Radford City deputies after a woman in his car, who was later identified as his fiance, was allegedly seen taking down his opponent's campaign signs. Hearst is the 12th district incumbent running for re-election. Officials say he was also driving with a suspended license. They say that woman, his girlfriend, Emily Frentress, took the campaign signs from a voting precinct last night, then got in Hearst's vehicle. She returned those signs after being ordered to do so by deputies and is not being charged. Now, here's a look at where this race stands now. I'm told that it's already been called this race. Uh, Jason Ballard has ousted Chris Hurst from the 12th district. He is uh, now no longer a member of the House of Delegates. Well, another race that the nation is watching closely tonight for governor is in New Jersey. Since 1989, every New Jersey governor elected has been a member of the opposite party of the sitting president. Incumbent Governor Phil Murphy is hoping to break that streak against Republican Jack Cicciarelli. Right now, NBC News has Cicciarelli leading with 51% to Murphy's 47. That race still too close to call tonight. And as the night progresses, remember that we're on your side into the overnight hours. Any updates that we get on polling results will go straight to our news app, as well as our other digital platforms. You can always count on NBC 12 for the very latest.